Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Okay. And uh, sorry, I forgot to put the page number in uh, for the reading. Um, it'll be there for the second service. <clears throat> uh, but it's in the Old Testament um, part of the Bible. And uh, you'll find it on page 353. And it's 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to be reading the first 39 verses. So the passage is entitled, uh, Elijah and the Prophets of Baal. After some time in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab, <clears throat> and I will send rain. So Elijah started out. The famine in Samaria was at its worst. So Ahab called in Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devout worshipper of the Lord. And when Jezebel was killing the Lord's prophets, Obadiah took a hundred of them, hid them in caves in two groups of 50, and provided them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, let us go and look at every spring and every river, riverbed in the land to see if we can find enough grass to keep the horses and mules alive. Maybe we won't have to kill any of our animals. They agreed on which part of the land each one would explore and set off in different directions. As Obadiah was on his way, he suddenly met Elijah. He recognised him, bowed low before him, and asked, Is it really you, sir? Yes, I'm Elijah, he answered. Go and tell your master, the king, that I am here. Obadiah answered, What have I done that you want to put me in danger of being killed by King Ahab? By the uh, living Lord your God, I swear that the Lord has made a search for you in every country in the world. Wherever the ruler of a country reported that you were not in his country, Ahab would require that ruler to swear that you could not be found. And now you want me to go and tell him that you are here? What if the Spirit of the Lord carries you off to some unknown place as soon as I leave? Then... When I tell Ahab that you, that you are here and he can't find you, he will put me to death. Remember that I have been a devout worshipper of the Lord ever since I was a boy. Haven't you heard that when Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord, I hid a hundred of them in caves in two groups of 50 and supplied them with food and water? So how can you order me to go and tell the king that you are here, he will kill me. Elijah answered, by the living Lord who, whom I serve, I promise that I will present myself to the king today. So Obadiah went to King Ahab and told him, and Ahab set off to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he said, so there you are, the worst troublemaker in Israel. I'm not the troublemaker, Elijah answered, you are, you and your father. You are disobeying the Lord's commands and worshipping worshiping the idols of Baal. Now order all of the people of Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel. Bring along the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who are supported by Queen Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and uh, the prophets of Baal to meet at Mount Carmel. Elijah went up to the people and said, How much longer will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. But the people didn't say a word. Then Elijah said, I am the only prophet of the Lord still left, but there are 450 prophets of Baal. Bring two balls. Let the prophets of Baal take one, kill it, cut it in pieces, and put it on, on the wood, but don't light the fire. I will do the same with the other ball. Then let the prophets of Baal pray to their God, and I will pray to the Lord. And the one who answers by sending fire, he is God. The people shouted their approval. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since there are so many of you, you take a bull and prepare it first. Pray to your God. Don't set fire to the wood. 
They took the ball that was brought to them, prepared it, and prayed to Baal until noon. They shouted, answer us, Baal, and kept dancing around the altar they had built. But no answer came. At noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Pray louder. He's a god. Maybe he is daydreaming or relieving himself. Or perhaps he's gone on a journey. Or maybe he's sleeping and, and you've got to wake him up. So the prophets prayed louder and cut themselves with knives and daggers according to their ritual until blood flowed. They kept on ranting and raving until the middle of the afternoon. But no answer came. Not a sound was heard. Then Elijah said to the people, come closer to me. And they all gathered round him. He set about repairing the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes, tribes named after the sons of Jacob, the man to whom the Lord had given the name Israel. With these stones, he rebuilt the altar for the worship of the Lord. He dug a trench round it, large enough to hold almost 14 litres of water. Then he placed the wood on the altar, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the offering and the wood. They did so. And he said, do it again. And they did. Do it once more, he said, and they did. The water ran down round the altar and filled the trench. At the hour of the afternoon sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and prayed, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, prove now that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant and have done all this at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you are bringing them back to yourself. The Lord sent fire down and it burnt up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones scorched the earth and dried up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they threw themselves on the ground and exclaimed, the Lord is God, the Lord alone is God. Thanks be to the Lord. Dear Lord, we pray as we uh, look at your word uh, this morning, I pray that you would uh, help me to speak. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us all to listen and uh, to understand what your word is telling us today and in and in what ways we can apply uh what we've read this morning to our own lives and to those around us amen uh people's homes have been flooded uh shops have had to be uh have, have been closed um and some people are asking where's boris where's boris johnson you know, why isn't he come out? Why isn't he showing support for the people whose homes have been damaged, um, whose livelihoods have been um, affected? You know, people are saying, well, surely if he went out and showed some sort of support, um, then, you know, um, he, it will be good uh, for him. You know, if he turned up and he, he had his uh, shirt sleeves rolled up and, he, you know, he got involved and, you know, started uh, helping with the cleanup, you'd think... Um, people would think, yes, you know, it shows that Boris Johnson uh, means business and he wants to get stuff done. Um, or at least, if he couldn't do it, at least delegate it to someone and say, right, you go along and uh, visit some of these communities that have been um, affected uh, by uh, some of these uh, floods. It would show that, you know, he cares and that, you know, he's compassionate to people's needs. Um, you'd think, well, surely it would be a good thing for him to make at least one public appearance. Well, problem is recent history tells us a, a different story. Often when politicians in different countries go out and uh, try and show their support for people, it, it, can, uh, it, it quite often can end uh, badly. Uh, you might remember the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, who went out to meet people who had been affected by some of the terrible fires uh, that took place uh, in many parts of Australia, but unfortunately it didn't go to plan. Um, you can see that he even had his, uh, uh, his sleeves rolled up there, he's the guy in the, on the white shirt, all got white shirts on, uh, the guy on the right hand side 
over there. He's the Australian Prime Minister. But um, he was heckled as soon as he got there. Um, I think the guy in the middle, um, he wasn't sort of patting him on the back. He was, he was literally telling him in no uncertain terms, get out of here, go back. Uh, you're not wanted, you know, you've, you've not be, uh, been any, any help to us. And all of this was being filmed. You know, the reporters were there. And uh, uh, when it went on to the news, uh, the news about him was for all the wrong reasons. It wasn't about, well, here's our uh, Prime Minister going to uh, help people out. It was about, here's our Prime Minister being heckled and uh, being shouted at by, for, by people. It was a, it was a complete uh, PR uh, disaster. Um, and uh, if we look back at Boris Johnson, some of the visits that he's done recently have not gone well. And there's been people that have um, uh, heckled in. And actually, the last picture uh, was taken in uh, Yorkshire, uh, where they had flood, floods back in November. And uh, it, it didn't go well. So maybe, uh, you know, Boris Johnson and his team have decided, you know, let's not uh, go out. It, it's not going to be uh, good for us. Um, and, uh, you know, I think people got to be quite bold and courageous to do uh, things like that. But there are many countries around the world where uh, you wouldn't even dare to speak up against uh, your, your government or your prime minister because, uh, um, well, there are all sorts of consequences. So, for example, if you lived in Azerbaijan, you could end up with two years corrective labour uh, if you humiliated the honour and dignity uh, of the president. If you were in Lebanon, uh, you could face fines or a maximum of one, uh, one month to two years in prison for the publication of material that undermines the dignity of the president of the republic. In Venezuela, uh, and they've got sort of uh, two uh, governments at the moment because they're all in dispute about who should be who, but uh, you could end up with 40 months in prison uh, if you offended in writing speech or by any other means the elected president or acting president. In Turkey, the law states, a person who defames the president of the republic shall be imprisoned for a term of one to four years, with the sentence to be increased by six if the offence is committed in public. That goes even if the president has been dead for 75 years. So it doesn't even need to be someone who's alive. There's a special law uh, on crimes against Turkey's founding father, the picture at the bottom, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, which states, anyone who publicly ins uh, insults or curses his memory shall be imprisoned with a sentence of between one to three years. And in Thailand, the country's constitution states, the king shall, uh, shall be enthroned in a position of revered worship and shall not be violated, it continues, no person shall expose the king to any sort of accu accusation or action. Anyone who forgets that and dares to defame, insult or threaten the king, his queen, the heir apparent or the regent shall be punished with imprison imprisonment with, um, of three to 15 years. And then today we read about King Ahab. Now I don't have a picture of King Ahab, but here's a... Uh, something that you'll find in the uh, British Museum called the Kirk Monolith. And it actually has, uh, it talks about King Ahab. Um, well, how does King Ahab compare to some of these other uh, leaders that we have? Uh, well, he would kill you if you gave him the wrong information, uh, even if it was, wasn't your fault. He had no respect for God um, or his prophets. In chapter 16, uh, sorry, in chapter 16 of uh, Kings, it says that he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the kings of Israel before him. And it, it wasn't just him, it was his wife Jezebel as well, who persuaded her husband, King Ahab, to promote the worship um, of Baals and Asherah. And she looked, as she looked for more power for herself, she sought, sought to destroy those who questioned her. And most of the prophets of the Lord Yahweh were murdered at her request. These are not people that you would stand up to. 
confront or speak your mind to. You would do as you were told without question. If you were not happy with any of their policies, you would just grin and bear it. If your home or business had been destroyed by a fire or flood, I can't imagine that you would uh, want to confront any of these people or King Ahab in, in public or in private. And we read today that uh, Obadiah and Elijah had the courage to uh, stand alone and stand strong for the Lord. Obadiah had the courage to hide and feed a hundred prophets, and Elijah had the courage and confidence uh, to confront King Ahab. Now, Obadiah was a devout, uh, prominent, and trustworthy man. We read that Obadiah was a good man who gave honour to the Lord. Verse 3 says that he was a de de devout believer in the Lord. King Ahab must have also trusted him because he gave him a, a prominent position. Obadiah was a palace administrator. In fact, he was in charge of the palace. Ahab entrusted him to run the daily affairs of the palace. He trusted him to search out the land for grass and water to feed some of the king's horses and mules. And it's thought that King Ahab may have had um, about 2,000 of these. And Obadiah was also a man that was a devout believer in the Lord. Um, so he was a devout believer in the Lord. He was in a prominent position and he was a man that could be trusted. Also, Obadiah was courageous, respectful, and yet at the same time afraid. He was courageous because we told that he hid those 100 prophets uh, of the Lord and supplied them with, with food and water. This must have been a great personal risk to himself. He hid the prophets. I imagine that you know, he did this without the knowledge of King Ahab. If Ahab had found out, well, I'm sure that he would have killed Obadiah. And even if Ahab didn't do it, then his wife Jezebel certainly would have if she had found out what he had done. We know this because Queen Jezebel was, was extremely wicked. She tried to force everyone to worship false gods. So she decided to kill all the prophets of the Lord. We read that in verse 4 and 13 of our reading. So Obadiah was courageous and he was able to be courageous because of his devotion to the Lord. He was respectful as well. We know this because of the way that he greeted Elijah. He showed great respect for him. He knew of Elijah's reputation. He knew of the things that um, Elijah had done. And he respected him because of the great things God had chosen to do for Elijah. But although uh, Obadiah was courageous, he was also afraid. You'd think it'd be a bit strange for someone to be courageous and, and afraid at the same time. But he was afraid to tell King Ahab of uh, Elijah's arrival because he might tell him, well, Elijah's here, um, he wants to meet you. Then King Ahab would go out and say, well, he's not here, he's gone, because that had happened in the past. People have told King Ahab, Elijah is here, the spirit of the Lord took him somewhere. That's another sermon in itself. I don't really understand what it means. But um, he was taken somewhere else. And, uh, uh, you know, kings had to swear like that they were telling the truth. So Obadiah was afraid that if he told the king uh, Elijah was here and he wasn't there, um, he would get into trouble. He didn't want to think that he was going to lead King Ahab um, astray. So Obadiah feared for his life. So Elijah promised uh, to meet the king so that Obadiah didn't need to fear. So Obadiah was courageous, respectful, but also afraid. Now, despite Jezebel's efforts, there were still many people uh, who were worshipping the Lord. Despite her persecution, um, it didn't eliminate completely 
those that remain faithful to the Lord. Even in our own palace, Obadiah remained faithful to the Lord. And over the course of history, persecution has caused uh, rapid growth of uh, uh, Christian communities, but also uh, persecution has also coincided with diminishing Christianity. For example, statistics on Christianity in Iraq are reversed from what they are in Iran and Afghanistan. Although Iraq is like Afghanistan in featuring both persecution and American presence, its Christian population is declining by about 2.5% a year. Christianity was once the dominant religion across North Africa, through the Middle East up into Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. European Christians were once a small minority of all Christians in the world. In the year 1050, Asia Minor, the land of seven churches in the book of Revelation, was nearly 100% Christian. 400 years later, and the population has dropped. Christian population had dropped to less than 15%. Turkey today is nearly all Muslim, and less than a quarter of a percent are Christian. But it's not only Islam that often displaces Christianity. Fed to lions and hunted into the catacombs, Christianity gradually grew to dominate the Roman Empire. During a time of nearly 300 years of persecution in Rome, Christians in Persia enjoyed relative freedom and were on their way to becoming the majority religion. Then after Christianity became the official religion, of the Roman Empire, more than 190,000 Christians were martyred in Persia over the next 40 years. You may not know it, but Christianity was actually established in China and eliminated at least twice. Relics and inscriptions show that Christians were present, free, and growing in China during the uh, Tang Dynasty. But when that dynasty dis disappeared, so did the Christians. Under Chairman Mao and Chinese communism, professing Christians in China grew from one and a half million in 1970 to 65 million in just 20 years. Franciscan friars established a Christian presence in China during the years of the Mongol rule, but they and their ministry uh, results disappeared after the Ming dynasty took over. Christianity arrived in Japan uh, with outside trade by the Portuguese in 1542, and it grew to a number of about 300,000 in about 50 years. But in 1587, Japan expelled all its foreigners, and in 1614, uh, uh, Christians came under intense persecution. When Japan allowed missionaries back in 1858, what they found to have survived was barely some recognizable Christian traditions in a handful of remote fishing and island communities. Some people say that there's a theory that explains why some persecution coincides with Christian growth and sometimes coincides with Christian decline. Martyrs, those that are persecuted and killed uh, for their faith, who are the same class and ethnicity um, of their killers become a persuasive Christian testimony. But the testimony of martyrs who are in a different class and ethnicity, ethnicity has no significant impact on their killers. The person, persecution that, we, that is happening today in parts of China, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, where Christian is growing occurs between people of the same class and ethnicity. However, persecution uh, that is happening where Christianity is diminishing uh, occurs between pe uh, different people groups. For example, in Iraq, the unreached people group, the Arabs, is prevailing over the reached uh, group, the Christian groups, the Assyrians. And it's almost been explained like this. 
When Christians become embedded in a people group like yeast in dough, the heat of persecution helps them to mature, propagate, and transform the loaf. But when Christians remain distinct or separate from a people group like chocolate chips in a cookie or a biscuit, then the heat of persecution makes them melt away. So the question is, what are we like on our front line, the place where we are every day? We may not be persecuted, we may have different issues, we may not have problems, but are we like yeast? Um, or are we sort of just uh, melting away and becoming like the people uh, around us? So whatever our front line, being treated badly uh, because, because of our faith can be a cause to strengthen our faith and to cause others to believe. We are the same type of people as our family, our neighbours, our colleagues at school, work or university. We speak the same language as those around us. That's a reason why it's important for us to remain uh, a part of the society um, that, we're in, that we're in and that we don't separate ourselves uh, from that society. Obadiah could have said to himself, you know what, I'm not going to work for someone like King Ahab. I'm going to keep myself separate from him and his regime. But if he hadn't have done that, or if he, if he had done that, then he wouldn't have had the impact that he did. Sometimes, like Obadiah, it's uh, right for a good person to serve a, um, a bad ruler. And uh, we must always, always give honour to God, um, whoever we work for. Uh, we can be working for people that don't respect God. And, uh, you know, Obadiah's employer, King Abraham, wasn't a nice person. He didn't share Obadiah's uh, beliefs or values. You could actually say that Ahab's beliefs were the complete opposite um, of those of uh, his employer, Obadiah. King Abraham oversaw the slaughter of the prophets of the Lord, whereas Obadiah sought to save them. King Ahab allowed the promotion of idol worship. Uh, Obadiah only worshipped God. King Ahab saw Elijah as a troublemaker. Obadiah treated him with respect. Despite this, Obadiah was able to maintain his trust uh, in the Lord. He did not agree with or participate in the practices of his employer or his ruler. He also chose to defy his employer's instructions. When Jezebel sought to kill the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah did the opposite. She wanted the prophets of the Lord dead. Um, he chose to save and provide for as many as he could. I mean, that must have been quite an endeavour um, to secretly hide, feed and provide for a hundred people without making that information public to anyone. I think Obadiah achieved quite a, a great deal on his front line. And when it comes to our front line, uh, we can show our belief uh, by the things that we do and the things that we say and who we give honour to. In Luke chapter 20, verse 25, it says, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. These two things are not mutually exclusive. We can do both of these at the same time. It's not, well, I could, I'll do one thing. I'll give to Caesar, our employer, or whatever. I'll give what belongs to them. And, but I won't give uh, what belongs to God. We can do both. It's not one or the other. And Obadiah was able to do that. On our front line, that's the place where we are every day, we may be in a, a hostile uh, environment, just like Obadiah was. On our front line, we can still serve God. We can still serve God when our environment is a hostile place. And we can and we should still maintain our values, our beliefs and our integrity as Obadiah is. The challenge is, what, is that what we are doing? Are we honouring God 
despite the challenges that we face on our front line. Now, I've got a short video to show you. Does anyone speak French? Okay. Well, you should recognize uh, the person that uh, this video is about. Suspendu dans le vide à son balcon, Frédéric Crota avec Michel Anglade. Regardez. Une scène a coupé le souffle. Hier après-midi, un enfant de 4 ans se retrouve dans le vide, accroché à la rambarde d'un balcon au quatrième étage. Tel un super-héros, un homme se lance à l'assaut de la façade à main nue. Athlétique et très agile. Sous les acclamations de la foule, il lui faudra environ 45 secondes pour escalader un à un les étages, prendre l'enfant par le bras et le mettre en sécurité. En bas, la foule reprend son souffle. Pour une raison que l'on ignore, les voisins sur le balcon mitoyen n'ont pas pu agripper l'enfant, mais ils étaient là pour le rassurer. OK, do you remember the story? Do you remember this guy? Um, was it... 22-year-old man from Mali called Mamadou Gassama, and he was praised as being a hero after he scaled an apartment building to save a child dangling from uh, a balcony. Uh, the child's father left the child alone uh, while he went shopping. Then he stopped to play Pokemon Go on his phone um, before returning home. Uh, Gassama said uh, he trembled with fear only after he reached the boy. Uh, and had gotten him to safety back over the balcony, balcony railing and then taken him inside the, the apartment. He was met by President Emmanuel Macron and he rewarded the young man's bravery with an offer of French citizenship and a job as a firefighter. And I think he's done it, he's completed his training and he may even be a firefighter now. Uh, but things didn't turn out so well for the father of the child though. He was detained overnight for uh, alleged parental neglect and appeared in court. Uh, President Emmanuel Macron said to Kasama, you saved a child. Without you, no one knows what would have become of him. You need courage and a capability to do that. Dressed in tattered blue jeans and a white shirt, the young man recounted for the president what took place after he and some friends saw a young child hanging from a fifth floor bank balcony. I ran, I crossed the street to save him, um, Gassama told Macron. Uh, he said he didn't think twice. When I started to climb, it gave me the courage to keep climbing. God helped me too, he said. Thank God I saved him. Bravo, Macron said to the 22-year-old uh, man during a meeting uh, in the Elysee Paris. And he received a gold medal from the French state for uh, courage and uh, devotion. And I think after this story, um, people hailed him as the Paris Spider-Man for the way that he was... Uh, uh, climbing up the building, and he was like uh, thought of as, as if he was some sort of um, uh, superhero. And uh, you know, when we maybe read about uh, people like Elijah um, in the Bible, we may think these guys are superheroes. You know, these are spiritual su superheroes. They're not, they're not in our league. They're completely different uh, to the rest of us. And there's no way we could be uh, anything like them. They're superhuman. We're just human. But you know, in uh, uh, James uh, chapter 5, verse eight, 17, it says this, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky, uh, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. So what is it that Elijah did that actually made a difference? Well, it's those two key words, he prayed earnestly. The word earnestly means with sincere and intense conviction. And praying earnestly is something that we can all do. We don't need to be like Elijah uh, to pray um, in that way. We don't need any type of special gift uh, to, be do, to do it. We don't need to be superhuman or superheroes uh, to be able to do it. It's something that we can all do. We can all find things in our life that we can give 
thanks for. I'm sure that we can. Uh, we can all find things that we can ask God to help us with or to ask God to change things in our lives. You don't need to be a superhero to pray the way that um, Elijah did. The Bible even gives us a model to pray if we're stuck and we don't know how to pray. We're given the Lord's Prayer as a model prayer that can start us off. Even though we're all in uh, different situations in our lives at the moment, we can all pray. If things are going well, we can pray. If life is not going so well, we can still pray. If we are healthy, we can pray. If we are unwell, we can pray. If we have good friends and family, we can pray. If we're alone, we can pray. We can give thanks for the things in our lives which are, are going well, for health, for food, clean water, uh, a place to live, lots of things that we, we often take for granted. We can ask God to help us through uh, difficult situations um, that we may be in at the moment. And, and the great thing about prayer is you, you can do it anywhere. You don't need to be uh, in a special place like a church to do it. Although the Bible tells us that we shouldn't neglect meeting together. Hebrews 10 verse 25 says that, you know, that we should still meet together to pray. There's, there's something really powerful in that. And it doesn't need to be audible. You know, we can pray in our thoughts. The point I really may want to make, though, um, is that our prayers and the prayers of others can have a real impact in the interactions um, that we have with people that we encounter on a daily basis on our front lines. Elijah was able to do what he did, not because he was a superhero or super spiritual, but because he earnestly prayed. And we can ha do the same too, and we can have an impact on our front lines if we earnestly pray. Both Obadiah and Elijah needed courage to stand alone. Obadiah needed courage to hide and provide for the 100 prophets of the Lord. Elijah needed confidence to stand alone. He stood alone against King Ahab and at least 800 prof, uh, 850 prophets um, of Bra Baal and Asherah. He needed confidence that God would answer his short prayer and confident uh, that the frantic prophesying of the 850 prophets would achieve nothing. It seems like these prophets were praying all day long. And if you read Elijah's prayer, I think it's about 60 words, less than 60 words long. And it has that, that great uh, impact. He needed um, prof uh, confidence that, you know, they wouldn't kill him for taunting them and making fun of their, their, um, their, their gods, their false gods. Uh, he needed confidence that God would still burn up the sacrifice, even if he poured water on it twice. Um, where did all this confidence come from? Was Elijah testing God? No, because in verse 36, it says that Elijah did all these things at the Lord's command. Elijah wasn't making things up as he, as he went along. God had told him how to do all of these things. God had told him exactly what he needed to do. Somehow God had given him clear instructions on what he should do and how, she, how he should do it. Elijah didn't need confidence. He needed confidence in God. I don't know how God communi communicated these instructions to Elijah, but we have plenty of verses in the Bible that tell us that we can have confidence in God. I have strength to face all, the, all conditions by the power that Christ gives in me. Philippians 4, 13. I have confidence in your strength. You are my refuge, O God. Psalm 59, 9. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Psalm 118, verse 6. For the spirit um, that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. 2 Timothy uh, uh, 1, verse 7. But when the spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and 
uh, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. Remember the Lord in everything you do. He will show you the right way. Proverbs 3 verse 6. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way uh, that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne uh, where there is grace. There There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. And that's in Hebrews 4. Uh, verses 14 to 16 and there's there's more verses there as well let's pray dear god uh, often we don't feel confident courageous or strong often we feel afraid uncertain and weak we look at the situation we face and see no way that we can improve it. We may be in a hostile environment or feel fearful for what the future holds for us. Help us, Lord God, to learn, remember, and hold on to the promises you give us in the Bible. Help us not to rely on our own reasoning, strength, and understanding, but to trust what your word tells us. Whenever or wherever we are weak, and wherever we are this week, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we ask that you would be with us, that you would direct us, and we would listen and we respond. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.